இது கிளைவர்ஸ் இன்வைட் எவ்ரி ஒன் just so the people could uh, get more specific on that i will try to ask janakaram once again to be part of so he will definitely join very soon uh we have some uh, from mexico city um we had pragash munka i guess from india Good evening everyone. So today discussion from uh, Dr. John Akram is going to be the supracellular lesions which are one of his interest. For those who don't know, uh he recently published a book on that on cellular paracellular and supracellular lesions that are going uh, that is uh, published on a theme on a team and everyone could join that too. Could buy a reserve his book. So let me ask Dr. John Akram if he can if he can join soon. Uh Yeah, there you go. It's it's a pleasure for me to have you once again here. Can you can you hear me, Jay? Let me unmute you. Can you hear me? see hello doctor yeah yes i can see you very well i was briefly introducing you by telling everyone the your interest in the recently published book on cellular supracellular and paracellular lesions so if for anyone interested it's a beautiful atlas i've gone to contribute to them i've been blessed and delighted to participate to that book and uh, and i hope that soon as this pandemic things are going to finish much more are going to come and we will be blessed to be back and attend live courses uh, in person so today i've requested jay for um uh talking about and presenting some videos so i think that he's just uploading new things it's india restarting and lifting the lockdown right yeah so uh, uh it's a it's a great evening uh first of all a big thanks to nezu sano um the organization which is headed by uh, none other than my very very close friend my brother uh, dr guya degni uh, i really love him i've met him several times in italy and also you know it, it was a pleasure to meet him also in other places and uh, in fact it's a great uh, opportunity for us to uh, meet everybody from all over the world uh, under a same platform a same roof and uh, it's going to be a very interesting uh, discussion rather than a lecture we will discuss and uh, we will try to learn from each other that's the idea of the whole association nezu sano which is doing a great academic uh, you know propagation of knowledge i am very sure that uh, this also will be uh, one of the most remembered uh, events in the history of nezu sano uh, thank you dr puya i think i might have to uh, take leave of you for 5 minutes because uh, we're supposed to start at 7 o'clock it's just 6:40 uh, indian time uh so we are uh, far before schedule so give me a little time i'm going to add a few good videos also so that it will become more interesting uh, because uh you know i'm nowadays working i'm seeing opd i'm operating so uh, you know i'm really uh, working more than uh you know the usual time so uh, i had to hurry on making this uh, presentation give me uh, just around 10 minutes and i'll be back with you with a bang okay so i'm going to put off the video you can chat with yourself i will hear you uh, but the thing is that i may not uh, start the lecture give me around 10 minutes for me to add two or three more videos 
All right, so I will put everybody on hold for uh, for 10 minutes. You, you can engage them, you can discuss, uh, Dr. Prakash Munka, everybody out there, you can discuss uh, about what topics you want and, uh, uh, you know, what is the next uh, topic you're going to conduct, all that you can discuss. I will be joining you in 10 minutes, okay? So I will Thank try you. to manage it for 10 minutes. And uh, regarding to that, uh, I will try to briefly anticipate and present the book, however, uh, which has been published recently. So for those who did, who's interested, I will try to put some slides on it just to interact with you more. For, for anyone that has kind of questions, please uh, send it right now. So we will be able to uh, face um, question and ask a question to Johnny Graham at the end of his talk. So, all right, so let me let me see. We have people connected from all around the world right now. Um, if anyone wants some questions, we will schedule it right now. So type it, there's a question and answer uh, proposition. You should use that one. Unfortunately, we, we had a changes schedule. So we have to uh, see what's going on on this. Just a quick reminder for the upcoming meetings. For those who don't know, on tomorrow at 3 p.m., this time is going to be exactly 3 p.m. Rome zone time, which correspond to 6.30 India time and uh, uh, 2 p.m. at London time. We we're going to have the second part of the talk from uh, Dr. Joao uh, Flavio uh, Nogueira from Brazil. Uh, recently, he has been published, uh, he attended last week uh, an, a meeting on uh, endoscopic anatomy of the middle ear, and uh, tomorrow he's going to talk about uh, the second part. After we explored the middle ear, this time we are going to focus more on what can we face after the initial dissection. Uh, he will also present some cases and uh, some practical advice on, um, on how to perform not only dissection, but also uh, surgery, so from planning. It's very important for everyone to understand that when we are approaching to the middle ear through the endoscope, the field should be clean. And uh, uh, per, I mean, most of the time we have to reach to, uh, in a place which is bloodless. And, uh, and also we have to prepare the patient correctly to avoid uh, a blood, uh, to reach a bloodless field. Why is it important? Because the middle ear and the anatomy of the middle ear is completely different from the endoscopic synonasal anatomy. And uh, the space that we will see in, in the synonasal anatomy is different from the middle ear. So just one drop can cause uh, and occlusion and some visual disturbances. I'm trying to see if I can show you the, the link or some slides from the books regarding the anatomy of the, uh, of the lesions. So we can go through this uh, before he, because, before Johnny Karam comes back. Uh, all right. Let me see this one. All right. Let's go for some anatomy first. So he will. Oh, by the way, so tomorrow is going to be the the the, the meeting on endoscopic anatomy of the middle ear, the second part. Then next week on Monday, don't forget to tune in for the anatomy of the cella and the cavernous sinus space. We have a brilliant lecture lecture with with videos and drawings uh, from Jacopo Dallan. For those who don't know, Jacopo Dallan previously participated in our um, live webinars, and he's going to present uh, case, uh, cases and anatomical specimen from the book that he wrote with the Maestro Castelnuovo and Manfred Chabischer. So don't forget to attend that one either. And regarding um, the, the appointment that is going to be after that, we will have uh, once again the second part with uh, Paolo Battaglia, which is going to be not this Saturday, but, <clears throat> but, the, the, but the week after. 
and it's going to be orbital decompression, anatomy of the medial compartment of the orbit, and how to perform an orbital decompression from the medial part to the lateral part, and then also we'll have some reconstruction flaps, endoscopic positioning of, um, of flaps for anterior skull base defects. Uh, the workhorse for this, as you, as you might know, for, in, for the endoscopic sign of, uh, sinuses, it's uh, the nasoceptor flap. However, there's uh, are a, a lot of different flaps that can be used to repair uh, anterior skull base defects. For, the, for example, the flip flap that could be tailored to cover also some orbital defects. Other meetings that are going to come is uh, this Friday. Don't forget to tune in for the... Um, uh, American Rhinologic Society Juniors meetings. I'm very excited about that. We will have four different panelists. I would like to introduce them. Uh, those four are going to be Sonia Marcus, Nicholas Rowan, Andrew Tambo, and Joshua Levy. Joshua have participated before in one uh, panel on empty nose syndrome, and the other three are going to talk with Joshua about the emergencies in rhinology from the clinic to the OR. Many uh, webinars has been uh, proposed during this period regarding COVID-19. However, we stick together. We still um, we still do think that uh, training and uh, um, and the lessons not only involving uh, COVID-19 are essential for bringing such uh, knowledge on rhinology, neurosurgery, and allergology. This meeting is going to be um, it's going to be live at 3 p.m. Ronzom time. I'm always pushing the Ronzom time because we are living in Italy. And after that, at 4 p.m., we will also participate and share. Uh, the the lesson from the maestro, uh, which is uh, sponsored not only from uh, uh, the contribution of our association, but also from the Italian Skull Base Society and the uh, um, Italian Academy of Rhinology and the Academy Italian Academy of uh, um, Cytology. And uh, those are going to be the recommendation for skull-based procedures during this COVID-19 pandemic. And it's going to be at 4 p.m. So the one uh, exactly after the first meeting with the ARS members. So coming back to the, to the supercellar, to the paracellar, supercellar lesion, I'm going to, uh, to share my screen and I will show you some um, slides from the book. Uh, this is not for promotion, this is just because uh, it's very important to recognize the anatomical perspective of the cellular region. We have always uh, to remind uh, the development of the of uh, the cranial base, which uh, is in three stages, uh, the membranous, the cartilaginous, the stage of ossification. We have to remind that embryology is essential for the classification and ossification center, which is dif different. So let me go back to the question. Endoscopic surgery is the latest trend, moving Microsoft to endoscopic center. While ID will be the same for this webinar, yeah, will probably not be the same for each webinar. Um, please do remind for everyone is attending, uh, every information could be delivered through our Facebook pages. However, we are providing the, the simultaneous sharing in all our uh, social networks. So that means Facebook, YouTube. Uh, uh, we also signed uh, for Daily Motion. You can watch it through that too, and a LinkedIn. For everyone interested, just go there and you can find it simultaneously. The difference between uh, the social networks and the webinars is because that you can ask questions directly through the pages. So coming back to here, um, the, from the book, you will see uh, anatomy, the develop, uh, development of the sphenoid sinus, uh, we will see the different, uh, um, uh, the, the different uh, uh, position of uh, um, the chiasmatic tuberculum planum angle, which is very important, and uh, Dr. John Karam will talk about that too. Uh, there's beautiful um, videos inside of it, and you will also see the different perspective and anatomical landmark to approach for different regions. So regarding that, also, we, have, we will have uh, 
uh, the classification of the pneumatization of the sphenoid. For those who don't know or doing the residency training, we also have to remind that uh, the cellar region differs on the pneumatization and a different classification. We will have a different perspective from here. We will have a conchal ossified cellar with no cavity. We will have a different type, which is type B. It's a precellar uh, sinus pneumatization. We will have a, a, a cellar type and a post-cellar pneumatization extending to the posterior wall of the cell. Why is this important? Every, every time we go in inside of the cell, we want to reach to, um, to uh, any, any pathologies. Uh, the more pneumatization we will have, the more uh, visible will be the structure behind it. However, we have to remind that uh, could be also possibility from some day sensors. So when we approach it to lesions uh, inside of that, we have to remind that the compartment is divided on a different uh, uh, on a, on a different uh, uh, places, which can be dangerous. Always remind that uh, internal carotid artery have some uh, degrees of orientation and. Uh, is placed in a different uh, and uh, perspective. It's uh, it's called depth of field. It's very important. It's important because, uh, as uh, um, Amin Kassam is always saying, uh, the depth of field is not uh, available when we're doing uh, pathologies through the endoscope because we don't have the three-dimensional spaces. And we also have to remember that the internal carotid artery has a tridimensional shape and has a different position in different places and segments of the carotid. So when we're approaching, always we have to remember that what are the uh, inter uh, carotid spaces that are vulnerable in the endoscopic procedure through the cella. And we also have to remind the other landmark, which are going to be talked about uh, Janakaram today. We, and this is it, this is a, a beautiful demonstration of the cella over here and all, all the compartment inside of it. Today, however, uh, what, uh, what John Karam is going to talk about is completely different, which are the supercellular lesion. We are going to be over here, upstairs, how to say, and, uh, and we will go through and reach in through a beautiful images. I remember uh, John Karam talking about uh, third ventricles, uh, mammillary bodies, uh, uh, and you will see beautiful picture about that. Um, can you have, uh, what's the, this ask, uh, question is, can you have your perspective of three endoscopic surgery? Yes, you can have, have your perspective uh, first uh, looking through, uh, first looking through the imaging. If you don't have uh, three-dimensional spaces, uh, you have to remind uh, that uh, <clears throat> anytime you're performing a, a surgery in that compartment, you have to watch imaging before that if you don't have a three-dimensional imaging guidance. And also you have to remember that everything, every time you're doing skull break procedures, I suggest to do it after you have some training also on open approaches. So we are having back our, our, uh, our friend, so, Dr. Jero, are you ready? I've interacted with, uh, with our uh, attendees uh, for a while. I've uh, told them about your beautiful uh, demonstration of pathologies on supercellular lesion regarding the third ventricle, mammillary bodies, and I think that you're ready to go right now. So, I leave you the torch. You can share your presentation now. So, um, first of all, uh, big thanks to uh, Dr. Priya Dagni. And uh, big thanks to uh, Association Nezusano. And uh, I'm sure that every participant here will know that uh, Association Nezusano uh, is equal to academics and uh, transferring academics throughout the world. And uh, without any, uh, you know, um, expecting any return. So this is actually true academic learning. And I really appreciate you, Dr. Kuya, for uh, starting this initiative. And I also thank you for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts on uh, uh, supracellular lesions. So uh, approach to supracellular lesions and uh, supracellular anatomy. So what we're going to do today is uh, actually a very um, a lucid uh, talk on supracellular lesions uh, as well as some videos, good videos on that. 
So I'm sure that uh, this talk is uh, more appropriate for a neurosurgeon uh, because neurosurgeons deal with this uh, more than uh, ENT surgeon. But uh, I happen to also uh, do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, combined work with neurosurgeons, a lot of neurosurgery. And so uh, this is one area which uh, really interests me. And uh, this is one of the uh, tumors uh, like craniopharyngioma is what we do a lot in our center. And so I chose this topic and I thank Dr. Priya for having uh, given this topic to me. Uh, with this introduction, uh, can I start my screen sharing, please? Sure. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to share my screen and uh, we will start here. Okay. Now, here we go. So the topic of today is endoscopic approach to suprasellar space. I am uh, Dr. Narayan Chanikram. I'm a skull-based surgeon. I'm from India. Uh, and uh, this is my website, my, my email ID. If you want to contact me, we give a lot of residency programs. I, am, I have had uh, people from Italy visiting me, uh, Professor Alberto Schre uh, Schreiber and uh, I've had the opportunity to, uh, you know, write a few books and involve all the uh, Italian brothers in the uh, book as well. So here we are. We're going to also, uh, I also happen to be a visiting neurosurgeon um, in the Department of Neurosurgery um, in Viet Duck Hospital, Vietnam, and also Dabao. I also happen to head the Asia Pacific Division of Carl Stores. I operate live surgeries. Uh, in the various Asian countries, uh, right from India down till around Taiwan. So um, also I operate regularly every year in Germany, uh, live surgical uh, procedures, so on skull base. So here we are, now we are uh, now going to discuss uh, endoscopic anatomy of the, um, of the uh, supracellar space. And before I uh, put on my pictures, I strongly recommend that you read uh, uh, these books uh, which I have written uh, and these are being authored by me. This is by Carl Storrs and this is my first book on ventral skull base and uh, this uh, came out a couple of, uh, I mean, I, th I think a decade before use of navigation in the skull base and uh, of course a monologue on uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma on which I am very much interested in. And of course, uh, these are the books I've already uh, authored uh, some chapters on, uh, Professor Aldo Stam, and of course, uh, Theodore Schwartz. And this is the book on which I'm going to center my talk on. This is on uh, cellar, supracellar, and paracellar lesion. And also, step-by-step uh, -step approach to endoscopic caravan dissection. And you can actually uh, see that uh, Dr. Puya has also authored one of the chapters in this book and our upcoming book on CSF Finoria with all the books with the theme, theme of publications. And you can go through the chapters. It's a, a really well demonstrated book because you can see the videos as well. Now, going on to the anatomy. Now, we are now going to concentrate on the uh, sphenoid sinus. As you all know, I think Dr. Puya, I, I had to skip some slides because Dr. Puya already introduced you to the various kinds of pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus. And that is a pre-cellar, cellar, and the conchal and the post-cellar type of pneumatization. So I removed that slide of the sphenoid sinus. Now what you're seeing is the uh, uh, interior of the sphenoid sinus. And what you're seeing here is the planum sphenoidale. This is the planum sphenoidale. And this is the, uh, the, the tuberculum. So if you see the midline anatomy of the sphenoid sinus, you have four areas. One is the planum, which forms the roof of the sphenoid sinus. And second is the tuberculum, that part of the uh, uh, the sphenoid uh, just between the two optic canals is called the tuberculum cellae. And of course, this is a big bulge called the uh, cella. That's the floor of the cella. And you have a cliva, a uh, clivus. That's the mid clival recess. So that's a clival, clival recess. So this is the planum, this is the tuberculum, this is the uh, cella, and this is the clivus. Now, today's uh, um, anatomy is all about the supracellular space. And let me tell you what is the key, what is the door, doorway to open up the supracellar space. And that is nothing but the medial optical carotid recess. So this is what I think everybody should practice in the caravan dissection. If you are doing a supracellar dissection, then the most important thing is to do a transplanar 
the transtubercular and uh, transtubercular approach, but more importantly, concentrate on this. So, what is this? I'm going to I'm going to define this area. See, this is the optic nerve. That's the optic nerve. That area between the optic nerve is called the tuberculum cellae. But the lateralmost part of the tuberculum cellae is nothing but the tubercular strut, the lateral tubercular strut, which is nothing but the medial opticocarotid recess. So this is the medial opticocarotid recess and exactly corresponds to the site of entry of the optic nerve or, or maybe the exit of the optic nerve from the intradural quadrant into the optic canal and the site of entry of the internal carotid artery uh, into the intradural space. So that exactly corresponds to the medial opticocarotid recess and this is called the MOCR. This is the MOCR. And only if you remove this MOCR, then it's the door, door to opening the room. The room is nothing but the supracellular space. So if you want to work without any uh, hindrance inside the supracellular space, then the most important thing I would say is to do the dissection and removal of the medial optical carotid recess. So this is the most important thing I want to uh, tell before I even start showing you the videos. Now, once I opened up the space, what do you see? So I've opened up the space, the supracellular space, and what do you see is head on, you see the optic chiasm. So you can see optic chiasm, that's the optic nerve, that's the optic nerve, that's the optic chiasm. And you see in the center, the stock, the pituitary stock, right in the center, and below the uh, supracellular space. What is the inferior boundary of the supracellular space? It's nothing but the diaphragma. Diaphragma is actually a layer of the dura. It's the meningeal layer of the dura. This is the diaphragma. So the diaphragma, the stalk pierces the diaphragma and goes down. And you see, uh, so this space, the supracellular space is divided into two, into two spaces by the optic chiasm. So the optic chiasm divides the supracellular space, the supracellular, we call it the system. We call it the system. We don't call it the space, we call it the system. Any, any space in front of the brain is called the system. So this is actually a system. The supracellular system is divided into the uh, uh, two compartments by the optic chiasm into a subchiasmatic system and a suprachiasmatic system. So that is a suprachiasmatic system here. Can you see my cursor very clearly, please, Dr. Puya? Yes. And this is the subchiasmatic system. So what are the con contents of the subchiasmatic system? The contents of the subchiasmatic system are the pituitary stalk right in the center. And the most important artery of that system is the superior hypophyseal artery. So superior hypophyseal artery is the first intradural branch of the internal carotid artery. So it's the first intradural branch of the internal carotid artery. And it comes from the internal carotid artery like this, and then it gives off three important branches. The first branch is the branch which goes behind. You can see there's a branch which is going behind, which is called the recurrent optic branch. This is the recurrent optic branch. And uh, please understand that this recurrent optic branch is an end artery. It's like the central retinal artery. It's an end artery. So this segment of the optic nerve is supplied by the recurrent optic branch of the superior hypophyseal artery. That means if there is a damage to this branch or the superior hypophyseal artery, then you might, if the patient presents with blindness, can remain blind because this part of the optic nerve is ischemic. It's not getting its blood supply because it's an end artery. Now, the next artery, of, uh, which is uh, the, the branch which is given off is the subdiaphragmatic plexus. So that's the uh, subdiaphragmatic plexus. That's the diaphragma, subdiaphragmatic plexus, and of course, the recurrent optic, descending diaphragmatic, and the subdiaphragmatic. So there's another branch which goes along the stalk downwards, which is called the descending diaphragmatic branch. This is the descending diaphragmatic branch. This is the subchiasmatic plexus, and this is the recurrent optic branch. So these are the three branches of the superior hypophyseal artery. Okay, now you can ask me a question. You see here, you can approach this uh, supracellular space from above. From above, why should you reach it? from below, why do you want to reach it from below? Uh, if, you, if I have a, any tumor here, then I can do a subfrontal approach and I can do a small suprabro approach and reach that tumor and get that tumor from above. That's where the concept of endoscopic skull base surgery comes in. Because what you see from above, you will see the optic chiasm. So you will see the optic chiasm and you will be viewing it from above. And 
below the optic chiasm, if you have a tumor on both sides of the optic chiasm, then it is difficult for us to see the superior hyphasal artery. So we will try to pull, and in that, what will happen is that you will shear this artery, and the recurrent optic branch goes off, and the patient becomes permanently blind. So that is why we always recommend that we go from below uh, because you're going to save the superior hyphasal branch and that can be done only by an endoscopic approach, not from above. So if you have a tumor above the chiasm, optic chiasm, if you have an, a tumor above the optic chiasm, it depends. You can actually uh, go from below, go from above. It depends upon the, uh, you know, uh, the convenience of the surgeon, the expertise of the surgeon. Uh, um, it depends on the tumor. It more depends. So the tumor dictates the approach. And we are not supposed to predetermine the approach uh, uh, just because you know the approach, it's not so. Or you do not know the approach, it's not the right thing to do. I, 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 if I feel that if the tumor needs an external approach, I am very open for it. And I will, I, I will ask my neurosurgeon to do that case from above because that tumor dictates an approach from above. But there are some tumors which are subchiasmatic or retrochiasmatic, and for that, I think the ideal approach would be an endoscopic approach. So this is very important. Now, what is the component? So that's the subchiasmatic uh, system. You can see the pituitary stalk here. That's a pituitary stalk. That's all the arachnoid. You can see all the arachnoid. That's the superior epistle artery. This is the recurrent optic branch, descending diaphragmatic, and subchiasmatic plexus here. And behind, you find a layer of arachnoid again, and if you pierce that, you have a a corridor between the stalk and the, this is the posterior clinoid process. You have a corridor here, which will lead you on to the interpeduncular fossa. This is called the interpeduncular fossa or the, uh, the retroinfundibular cistern. So you have a cistern here. But we are now bothered more about this area, which is again, this is subchiasmatic area, and the suprachiasmatic area. As I told you, the uh, supracellar cistern is divided by the optic chiasm into a subchiasmatic and a suprachiasmatic system. So we have dealt with the subchiasmatic system, and now we're going to go for the suprachiasmatic system. So if you look at this, this is the cella. So that's the cella, transcellar approach right to the cella, and then you go to the subchiasmatic system. But what do you find in the suprachiasmatic system? You see here, the suprachiasmatic system uh, it has nothing but the anterior circulation. That's the circle of villus, which is completed. You see, this is the A1, this is the A comb, and that's the A2. That's the recurrent artery of Hubner. So you can see that very clearly, the anterior circulation is right above the suprachiasmatic system. And if you go behind this ACOM here, you will find the lamina terminalis and you will have a translaminar approach to the third ventricle. So that is how you approach the... So basically, I advise you, my dear friends, to actually do a lot of dissections before you really do uh, surgery in the supracellar because the anterior circulation is a very delicate circulation and it's it's not very easy to operate right right there without good uh, uh, training on cadavers. Now let us have a close-up of the suprachiasmatic system. You see that's the uh, chiasm, that's the suprachiasmatic system. You can have the anterior communicating artery. That's the A1 segment, that's the A2 segment and that's the ACOM. The ACOM the A1, A1, the, the communicating vessel divides the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the vessel, any vessel in a major vessel into a, a first segment and the second segment. So that's the A1, uh, ACOM, and this is the A1, and the, that's the A2. So that's distal to the uh, ACOM is the A2, and that's the recurrent artery of Hubner. So that is how you see that. So this is actually a, a view if you transpose the pituitary. So this is the retrocellular area. Retro, because this area is going to come very frequently in your uh, uh, dissection and also your videos. So you should be uh, aware of this area, which is behind the cella, behind the cella or behind the posterior clinoid process. You see, that's the basilar artery. This is the basilar artery. This is the basilar tip. This is the basilar tip. And it divides into a superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebral artery. And between that, you will have the third cranial nerve. You're going to see that. So you see that beautiful a view of the mammillary bodies. You can see the mammillary bodies. That's actually the P1 perforators. They are all the P1. That's a, uh, again, the p -com divides. The p -com is a branch of the internal carotid artery, which divides the posterior cerebral artery into a P1 segment and a P2 segment. And the P1 gives off a lot of perforators. There are four perforators given off by the uh, P1 
one segment out of which actually the most important is the posterior thalamo uh, perforator that's a very important thalamo um, perforator the anterior thalamo perforator is given off by the pcom so these are all very intricate details which a neurosurgeon should know before he dissects in the uh, uh, in the uh, interpeduncular system and you can see here the mammillary bodies and just in front of the mammillary body you find the tuber scenarium this is the tuber scenarium and that's called the uh, you actually if you do a ventriclostomy and you do a third ventriclostomy you will actually puncture this from above and you will open up uh, this for a colloid cyst or whatever or a, a hydrocephalus or whatever so that's that's what you do and once you enter into the third ventricle what you see is this from below if you see it from below from above you will see it from that's a lateral ventricle you will see from above if you do a third ventriclostomy but if you see from below th through the tuber scenarium this is what you will see you will see that's that's actually the choroid plexus this is the foramen of monro you can see very clearly the foramen of monro which will lead the third ventricle on that's a communication between the third ventricle and the lateral ventricle and of course you will find that's the uh, you will find the aqueduct of sylvius which communicates the uh, third ventricle to the fourth ventricle here so that's a communication the foramen of monro which communicates the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle and the uh, aqueduct of sylvius which communicates the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle and this is the choroid plexus you all know that the choroid plexus is responsible for protection of cerebrospinal fluid so that's uh, uh, and you will have the anterior commissure here and the posterior commissure and all that so this is actually the view which you see when you open you see the cella and just above the cella and below the cella you have the superior intercavernous sinus and the inferior intercavernous sinus so you have the superior intercavernous sinus so that's the cella so once you do a supracellular tumor what we do is we drill around the cella we drill uh, above the cella that superior intercavernous sinus area and then you drill the trans tubercular approach you drill the tubercular and then you drill the planum so you do what is called the transplanar trans tubercular trans cellular approach to any tumor which is occupying this region so that is the supracellular space so you find that the carotid is on either side like a cobra this is like a cobra going and protecting a peanut this is a cobra on a peanut appearance it's called the cobra the two cobras on a peanut peanut is the pituitary and the cobras are the uh, uh, the uh, carotid so that's a clinoidal carotid on either side of course you have the uh, paracellular carotid here and that's the clinoidal carotid and then it will go into the intradural carotid so you should be very thorough with this anatomy i have now showed you uh, 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 this is uh, the cella above it will be the superior intercavernous sinus and then you have the tuberculum cellae laterally you have the medial optical carotid recess we have removed that and given a fantastic exposure this is the exposure we give for every case of a supracellular tumor so here we are so we will now stop here i'm going to stop share and what we are going to do is to answer questions with regard to anatomy so we will go on and uh, we will ask our participants because we have to go step by step there's no point in me actually talking 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 you will get bored now we will throw the audience and we will throw the whole uh, you know house open for questions if you have any questions regarding anatomy please ask me it's, dr puya it's, it's about the time i guess yes to have some questions the first question i would like to address is uh, is this uh, when you when you performing uh, uh, any kind of procedure and you want to go in a supracellular space uh, or you have a, a, a technique for manipulating the hypothesis to avoid uh, injuries what, what are your suggestion the instrumentation uh, the cotinoids you're using uh, what are you doing to avoid injuries uh, on the superior hypophyseal artery and and the hypothesis so that, that that question is more clinical question and you're going to see the answer uh, in my surgical videos so i will answer that in my surgical videos so i will postpone the answer uh, when you uh, see the videos you will get the answer you have any questions regarding anatomy we will take the questions oh yeah there are some questions here however i think that they will be re replied when you're doing the videos because one of them is the limitation of supracellular growth for endoscopic removal i think that is uh, a clinical questions also okay so we will now uh, you don't have any questions regarding anatomy we will go in for the videos now okay 
Right. Oh uh, yeah, there's a one over here. It's uh, what's the minimal intercarotid distance for transphenoid approaches? Yeah, good. That's a very good question, actually. I I, I actually wanted that question to be asked. So uh, I'm going to share that screen and I'm going to show you. That's a brilliant question by some participant. Maybe he's doing a lot of cases. That's why he's asking that question. Now, what I'm going to do is actually go here and I'm going to discuss that in detail. So here we are. I'm going to put this video and you see here this. So many, many people I've seen actually have a wrong notion about the intercarotid distance. Many people measure the distance between the paraclival carotid and talk about it. I feel a little sad when they say that or they, they measure the distance at the level of the cella and talk about it, or the paracellar region and talk about it. No, actually, when you talk about the intracarotid distance, you should talk between the medial edges of the medial optical carotid recess. So actually, this is the distance between the two medial optical carotid recesses. So that's actually the intracarotid distance. So that ideally, ideally should be around 1.5 centimeters. So that will be the ideal distance. So you can operate anywhere between nine millimeters to 1.5 centimeters, but less than nine, it's going to be difficult because you're now going to, uh, th these two carotids, something like a kissing carotid, it's going to come like that. So you might have to move the carotid and operate. So which is going to be uh, a more, you know, technically difficult. So the least I've operated on is seven, but then I think, Anything which is uh, more than one will be suitable for beginners. Don't choose anything below one. Below one centimeter is going to be very, very difficult for you to open this corridor and work here. And if you find a big tumor, I think if it is around six million, we have had uh, uh, cases where you've had a very narrow intercarotid distance. Straight away, you see it on the uh, MRA and then you just uh, you ask your neurosurgeon to do it rather than to go uh, endoscopic and do that. It's it's almost not possible. So I hope I answered my question. Your question? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. There's a one question that was to explain once again the Cobra and Peanut. However, I think that they can watch the video again and uh, we will go ahead with, with the with the videos because we don't we, we because of lack of time. Okay. So what what is the duration of my talk? Uh, How from long? From now, 25 minutes, if it's okay ah, for you. 25 minutes, okay, perfect. So I'm gonna show you just one one video, that's all in each one, okay? So I'm gonna start with a supracellar. Uh, so the usual common tumor, there are so many tumors which can come here. You've dealt with so, so, so many tumors like pituitary uh, tumors is the commonest. Of course, uh, 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 the second common in our center is skinopharyngioma. Then we have the uh, tuberculum planum meningiomas. We have astrocytomas, we have uh, Rathke's clepsis, we have uh, uh, cardomas, we have so many tumors. Uh, we have uh, gliomas, optic nerve sheath gliomas, chiasmatic gliomas, so many things. But what we are going to deal with, because of lack of time, we'll just show you uh, a one representative video in each one. So that'll be uh, 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 25 minutes, so you can actually see. Uh, but I have, uh, I have planned for, I thought it could be two hours, I had around 15, 20 videos. Uh, but then I'm not going to show you all that video. So it's going to be a second part, however, so you yeah. have it's going to be a time part one now. Then we will plan the second part. Ah, okay, that's great. That's great. So then, what I will do is I will uh, try to start with this video, which is actually a basic video on how to approach the supracellular space. So uh, this is a pituitary. This is the commonest tumor in the supracellular quadrant. But I just want to um, tell you there's a difference between this tumor, that's a pituitary going supracellar, and the other tumors, because usually in a pituitary which is uh, uh, pushing up, you will have a layer of dura above it. it. You will have a layer of dura. It's usually not penetrated. Of course, we have had cases which have penetrated the dura and gone inside the supracellar uh, cistern, but Classically, usually the diaphragma is pushed upwards. That's a layer, meningeal layer of dura, which is pushed upwards. So you will have necessarily a, a layer of dura above the tumor, which is actually a pituitary tumor. So you can see here, now this is actually a 37 year old female 
And you can see here, now I'm going to pass this video and I'm going to show you that this is the cellar component. This is the cellar component. And that's the supracellar component. This is the supracellar component. And if you look at it, it looks like a snowman. You see here, it looks like a snowman. This is what is called the snowman appearance. So this is the snowman appearance. So the common question uh, asked during the exams is that, what is the cause for the snowman appearance? And usually the answer would be the diaphragma. No, it's not the diaphragma. It's the medial optical carotid recess. So the, there are two constrictions here that the constriction is formed by the medial optical carotid recess. And if you find that if you actually drill off that medial optical carotid recess on both sides, this snowman will become a, a cylindrical tumor. So that's very important to very important to know that if a tumor is going very high supracellar, try to remove the medial optical carotid recess on both sides and this will actually descend down. So the, the point which is preventing this component from descending down is the MOCR. That's very important. Now you can see here, so that's a supracellar component here and that's a cellar component, very clear. Now this is the layer of dura. This is, you can see very beautifully the layer of dura above it. See the layer of dura, that's a T2 weighted MRI and that's a T1. You can see that very clearly. And now we will see how we proceed with operating this case of a pituitary uh, macroadenoma going. Of course, you have a lot of classifications. I don't want to go into the theory. Read the theory and you just see the videos here. Now you start like this. You start resecting partially the middle turbinate. Of course, there are centers where they don't resect the middle turbinate. And what we do now is to, la but we, I'm trained in Pittsburgh, so uh, I would love to do it this way. Uh, and you can see that that's what is called the cavity and a half. You're seeing that I'm opening up the posterior ethmoids. And now on the left side, moving the middle superior turbinate, you're able to see the sphenoid os. And for all cases, all cases involving the supracellar, very high supracellar, or maybe a craniopharyngioma, we always, always take a Haddad flap. So that's a nasoceptal flap. But of course, for this case, I'm just taking a rescue flap. This is what is called a rescue flap. So what is a rescue flap? A rescue flap is one where you, you do not complete the anterior incision of the nasoceptal flap. You see how I'm elevating the, uh, the rescue flap. You elevate it downwards. You see here how beautifully you can see and you elevate it right till the pterygosphenoid synchondrosis. This is pterygosphenoid synchondrosis. And this is the palatovaginal canal. That's the palatovaginal canal. So once you do that, that's a rescue flap. You do it on both sides. And then you do what's called the triple osteotomy. You see here, that's the owl's eye appearance. Do a posterior septectomy, you get an owl's eye appearance. And then this is called the planar osteotomy. And this is called the shoulder osteotomy. And you get both these, uh, uh, all the three osteotomies and then you remove this rostrum. So this is step one of the exposure. And what you do next is you remove that mucosa. Some people use that as a flap. I don't use that as a flap. I remove that mucosa because I have already got a Haddad flap. Haddad flap should not be placed over mucosa. This is very, very important because you land up in a mucosine. Now this is the exposure which we give. Now let's stop the video here and just see that's the cella. This is the cella. This is the paraclinoid, that's the cobra. This is the cobra. You can see that this is the, uh, the, the, the internal carotid artery on both sides. This is the optic, that's the optic. You, this, is the, this is the tuberculum. This is the tuberculum and that's the planum. So for a, a, a pituitary with a supracellar extension, what would I do? If it is not very high supracellar, then I would do a transcellar, transtubercular approach. So I would remove that bone between the two optic canals, and I would remove the medial optical carotid recess. This is the medial optical carotid recess on both sides. So I would like to remove that because that gives you the door, opening the door to the supracellar uh, uh, system. So of course, we don't have to open the dura for a pituitary. Now you see that's a carotid very clearly. You can see the pulsations of the carotid. And now we use a three millimeter diamond burr. You see here, we use a three millimeter. And you see how I'm moving my burr. It's like a paint brush. It's like a paint brush. And you see how Dr. Shilpi Bhadia Sharma is giving me the views. So once I do the tubercular drilling, I'm now removing the bone. And you can see that's a transcellar. So beautiful, you can see. That is the endosteal layer of dura. This, there are two layers of dura in front of the cella. 
One is the endosial layer, second is the meningeal layer. Here you are able to see that we have removed the bone and we have exposed the endosteal layer. Now what should I do? I have to remove the medial optical carotid recess. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do right now. See that? Now, I see that, see that, see that. That is the medial optical. So once you remove that, what happens? This tumor in the supracellar quadrant descends down. That descends down. So see that? Very beautiful, very nicely seen. And here is where the superior intercavernous sinus is. So in this case, in, in a case which is having just a small, so I'm just mapping the carotid. I usually use a Doppler. And then what we do is we are now making an incision and a U-flap. You see how I'm making that U-flap. This is a U-flap. And you make that U-flap just medial to the carotid. And of course, you do that. And you can see that I'm now going to rise that flap. Of course, what I will do is to rise that flap now. I'm now see that that's the Rosen's elevator and gently, gently, gently rise that flap. And you see that flap has gone towards the planum. And then what you do, take a biopsy. That's a biopsy which is being taken. And you do what's called the two suction technique. This is called two suction technique as advocated Professor Amin Kassam, by Professor Amin Kassam. You can see that very clearly. And I am doing that to expose the meningeal layer of it. You have a tunica around that tumor. You just, just try to remove that tumor from the cavernous sinus. So that's a six o'clock dissection. And then go for the three o'clock. That's a three o'clock position. And then you can see here, that's the nine o'clock position. You can see the carotid on the nine o'clock position. But of course, let me concentrate here on the supracellar dissection because we are... So what happens is I've finished off the cavernous sinus. If you want a separate lecture on the paracellar, then we can give it later. But I will now concentrate on the super. So that's actually the cavernous sinus. We have so many points to discuss on the cavernous sinus. So we have so many points. We will uh, discuss with Dr. Poya if he wants a, a, a separate lecture on the cavernous sinus dissection of tumors. Now, let us go on to supracellar. Let me now go on to the supracellar. So that's a cavernous sin sinus being dissected. Now, the final part of the dissection should be supracellar dissection. And you see here, whenever you do a pituitary supracellar dissection, always do it from backwards front, that is from posterior to anterior. Point number one, do it from posterior to anterior. And always you go in the posterior lateral region. That's called the posterior superolateral region, which is actually the hidden area of uh, the tumor. So you will actually start the tumor uh, in the supracellar quadrant from the posterior superolateral quadrant. You see that I'm trying to expose. That's called the Q-tip technique. This is called the Q-tip technique. What is the Q-tip technique? You just try to push the diaphragma and you reduce the power of the suction. Very important. You see how this is the Q-tip technique. I'm pushing the diaphragma above, having a look at the supracellar quadrant. You see how beautifully you can see how the views are. You see that's a bluish diaphragma and you see a, a yellowish normal gland. So the normal gland is seen here. The normal gland is yellowish. You have vascularity and the, the diaphragma is bluish. So that's the supracellar quadrant. Of course, again and again, try to ruminate on that. Try to do the dissection again and again so that you don't leave behind any remnant in the supracellar quadrant. So many surgeons, once they see the descent of the diaphragma, they think the surgery is over. I always tell my residents, when, the, when you see the descent of the diaphragma, that is when the surgery begins. That is when the surgery begins. Only then you can remove the tumor completely or else some 5 to 10 percent of the tumor will be left behind and actually that will produce recurrence. So this is how you dissect it. I have shown you just one case. I'm going to show you another case, a very, very nice case of a, a, a fibrous pituitary. You see, I'm going to concentrate only on the, uh, uh, on the supracellar uh, dissection because we are dealing with the supracellar quadrant. Of course, uh, Dr. Shilpi Bhadia Sharma and me uh, did this case in a neurosurgical conference uh, uh, in one part of India called Nagpur. I'm now going to show you the uh, scan. Uh, the scan, where is the scan? Wait, escape. So I think you can see the scan here. Uh, it's a small scan, but you can see the supracellar tumor there. And you can see that it's enhancing on a T1 with contrast. And if it's enhancing, that means it is actually uh, um, fibrous uh, tumor. This is not one second.
Deshmukh from India, 35-year-old female person with history of bi-temporal hemianopia. Now that's a scan. You can see a huge double. Now here again, you can see that that's a supracellular quadrant. The tumor is fibrous, and how do you dissect a fibrous tumor from the supracellular quadrant? So this is very important. So what should be my plan? My plan should be a transcellular, transtubercular, and a transplanar approach for this case. So exactly what I'm going to do in this case. Shape snowman tumor of the pituitary. You can see the uh, cellar widening, and uh, this is the exposure which we gave. You can see the optic, the tuberculum, the planum, and uh, we have completed the exposure, and uh, you can see the uh, optic to optic, chloride to chloride, and uh, superiorly the planum till the uh, floor of the sphenoid sinus. That's a climate recess, uh, and you can see how beautiful the exposure is. And now we start drilling, and uh, this is the drilling of the uh, cellar floor. You can see that uh, we do a four-handed technique, uh, Dr. Shilpi Bhadiya Sharma and Umkar Deshmukh are assisting me. And uh, you can see that uh, I start from the level of the uh, superior part of the cellar floor, and we drill it uh, to make it actual thin. You can see that that was actually the intestinal septa there that was getting attached, and that's why it's thick. And uh, you can see now that uh, there is a little bit of venous bleeding, and uh, that is controlled by warm saline irrigation. And once we uh, eggshell thin the bone, we use the Rosen's elevator to uh, elevate the bone of the cellar floor. You can see that the endosteal layer of the uh, pituitary is getting exposed. You have two layers. Uh, uh, that is the endosteal layer and the meningeal layer of pura, and uh, you can see that uh, gently we are taking off the bone from the floor of the cellar. And once we do that, we expose. The most important thing in the surgery is the exposure. And once you have a very good exposure, then you can deal with uh, a fibrous tumor like this. Uh, this patient needs a transtubercular and a transcellular approach because it's going very high supracellar and the dissection should be uh, uh, done extracapsular. We anticipated it. A part of this tumor was also liquid. And as you can see in the uh, scan pictures, and you can see... So now I, what I'm going to do is to skip a little bit here and then just go on to the exposure. That's a transtubercular approach. And then I'm going to start and I'm just going to forward this video. That's a, a little bit which was liquid, and then I go in for an extra capsular dissection. Now we will see how we do the extra capsular dissection. I'm going to show you that exactly how we do an extra capsular dissection. Leak. We have a hard flap. We are prepared to deal with the leak. You can see that how the tumor is descending now, and you can see that uh, see the dissection how it's being done. The gospel is used to just compress that bit of tumor. No traction. The section is being done with the right hand. This is just holding, holding the tumor, not pulling the tumor. Just hold the tumor. And then dissect with the freers. You see that? That's a pituitary elevator. And I'm trying to dissect the diaphragma. Never, never try to pull. That's not the right way to dissect. It's very important. And you can see here that I'm now trying to dissect the supracellular uh, fibrous tissue. That's called the extra capsular dissection. This is called the extra capsular dissection. See, what I'm trying to do is to take off a little bit and then try to segmentalize it. And once you do that, you see that. Diaphragma is descending there, which is actually not good because you have tumor remnant behind the diaphragma. That's why you always say that you start the dissection from posterior to anterior. Here, the anterior part of the tumor came came off, now but the posterior part of the tumor is still there. Very small residue of the tumor. And now, what I'm going to do is to dissect the residue of the tumor. You see how I'm dissecting the residue of the tumor. See that? Gently try to elevate that diaphragma. And you can see now that I'm dissecting the fibrous tumor away from the diaphragma. Extremely careful not to leave behind any tumor there. So in fact, I love fibrous tumors. Is. This is very important. Uh, I love fibrous tumors because I will not leave behind any tumor remnant. So I'm going to show you the next part. There are three parts in this video. I just want to show you 
The next part, how we deliver the tumor. You can see that now. That's the dissection of the uh, suprasellar part of the tumor. You see how the diaphragma is beautifully being dissected of the tumor. This is very important. I al always believe that uh, if you do an extracapsular dissection, it's, it's actually a brilliant way to dissect a fibrous tumor. So go around the tumor, you see here now, that's the diaphragma. See how nicely I'm irrigating that. And can you all appreciate that? Dr. Puya, can you see the dissection of the pituitary now? And you can see the fibrous tumor which has come out. Yes. So that, that's basically the uh, uh, fibrous tumor, how you dissect a fibrous tumor and you always irrigate nicely with uh, saline or ring lactate depends and then you don't have any bleeding. That's very important that you don't have bleeding in the suprasellar because that, that becomes a sort of a, a, a you know, a subarachnoid hemorrhage kind of thing. You should not leave behind any clot. Uh, absolute, uh, you know, have to wash, wash, wash with a lot of saline and make sure that there is no bleeding. And then, of course, then you can place the Hara flap. Uh, now you can see that I'm still inspecting, inspecting. So, so that's very important. And then what you do is place that fat. You can see what I'm trying to uh, do for reconstruction. I'm trying to place fat in the cellar uh, space. You can see that that is the fat going there. That's the first layer of repair. Of course, this patient did not have a big uh, uh, rent in the diaphragma. The, it was thinned out, but did, did not have a big rent. And that's the Haddad flap. See how beautifully it's closing that area. And once you do that, it's it's absolutely 100% removal with a complete seal of that diaphragma, so uh, of that uh, area. So that's that's how I believe that you should actually do a closure. You should have a very good hadat flap, a nasoceptal flap, and then you should push a fat inside like a dumbbell. And of course, this is all subdiaphragmatic. Please understand, this tumor is subdiaphragmatic, so you can do all this. But in case you want to do something different, you want to do a tumor, which is not subdiaphragmatic. I'm going to show you a tumor, which is not sub. Of course, I will show you one other case, very interesting case I want to show of this pituitary. Very rare to see such cases. That's why I want to show you this case. Before you go in, uh, when you, before you upload in your uh, video, it's, uh, can you tell us, uh, because there's a question, uh, yeah. could you explain the difference between extra and intracapsular dissection? Okay, so I'm, that's a very good question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you and then I will tell you what's the difference between the extracapsular and intracapsular. So people understand what do you mean by extracapsular? What do you mean by intracapsular? Now here is where I showed you a tumor. And when, once I opened the tumor, what did you find? You found it liquid. This is completely liquid. So you cannot find a plane in a liquid between this and the meningeal layer of dura. So you see here, that's a liquid tumor. You cannot find a plane around this tumor. Because it's liquid, you cannot find a plane. So what do you have to do? You have to suck it out. So if you suck it out, it's called intracapsular. You go inside the capsule and you dissect it intracapsular. See that, the capsule is here. This is a capsule, you can see the capsule of the tumor. So what happens is that I cannot find a plane between the tumor and the capsule. So I go inside the tumor and suck the tumor, and this is called intracapsular dissection. Now, the other part is, you see here, I will show you this tumor, very clearly seen, this tumor. This tumor is actually firm. So I am going around the tumor. You see that this is the tumor in the center. This is the tumor in the center. I'm going to show you, this is the tumor in the center. That's the capsule. I go around the tumor, dissect that tumor in one piece and take it out. So if you dissect it around the tumor without going inside the tumor, this is called extra capsular dissection. Okay, so clear? All of you clear about that? So how do you decide whether this, this surgery needs an intracapsular or an extra capsular dissection? This is the most important part of a surgeon. This is decided pre-operatively. How do you decide pre-operatively whether you need an intracapsular dissection or extracapsular dissection? For that, you have to do an MRI. An MRI, T1, 
please understand this is the formula this is a very important formula everybody should remember in the t1 weighted image if you find an iso intense iso intense means same intensity as the brain iso intense image and you will find always in the t1 you can see the normal gland the normal gland will be pushed upwards in case of pituitary and you will see it as a bright spot you will see it as a bright spot or a pancake appearance on the superior part you will find the normal gland okay so in a t1 you have an iso intense image but the t2 is the most important in the t2 you will find variable intensity you will have hyper intense you will have iso intense i will have uh, uh, iso hypo so you will have a varying like a salt and pepper appearance you will have so why because of the hemorrhage because of the hemorrhage inside the tumor you will have like a salt pepper appearance you will have the uh, hyper intensity with hypo intensity with the hyper all this mixed means it is a liquid tumor please this is very very important so in a liquid tumor i already prepare myself to go intra capsular very very important now okay sometimes the t2 can be either like this some parts might be uh, a liquid some parts might be solid always do do a t1 with contrast a t1 with contrast if you find iso intensity we have a plain scan which is enhancing with the contrast it is most probably fibrous you see how we are actually like a chest chest move you should actually plan your surgery so now a t1 with contrast you are finding an hyper uh, um, it's a it's a potato like tumor completely um, enhancing no difference in intensity completely enhancing hypercellular this is a fibrous tumor and then you do a dwi so you have a diffusion weighted image and in that if you have high diffusion weighted image then high intensity then you might have a liquid tumor if you have a low diffusion weighted image you have a fibrous tumor now preoperatively you decide okay this is a case of a intracapsular tumor dissection this is a case of an extra capsule what is the difference how what is the difference you might have the same tumor in the supracellular quadrant you might have the same tumor the difference is if you just remove the medial optico carotid recess what will happen is the tumor if it is liquid will fall down so your exposure is limited same way you don't have to uh, dissect and remove the carotid canal whereas in an extra capsule dissection we necessarily have to dissect on the carotid and you have to expose the carotid completely because the tumor is to going to get adherent with the cavernous sinus so you are going to do an extra capsular dissection so you need to expose the carotid canal that is why pre operatively i will decide whether i am going to expose the carotid canal or not i am going to drill the tuberculum planum or not with respect to the mri i know whether i have to do an extra capsular dissection or an intra capsular dissection pre operatively i hope i am very clear about this did i answer your question dr puya yes that's perfect just because you also uh re reply to other questions that was uh, reaching uh to the to the thought about the um the images guidance uh, that you should use so you both on the um, reply to them uh would you would you show the last case or we want to we want to i'll give you one more case just uh, uh, because yes. i have so many cases very interesting cases I, i that's why i'm 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 always fascinated to have you as a guest because of your ability and capability to explain not only the the, the differences between the tumors and the anatomy but also explaining the essential before approaching such tumors uh, radiology uh, studies that are behind and before doing such cases there are enormous uh, the efforts to make such cases so i think that importance of teaching those pillars and those tips are essential and i'm very glad to have you here to explain that so go ahead with your with your last with my your last, last video i want to show you uh, this very very interesting uh, video of course the the topic of today is a supracellular tumor so i have to talk about uh, the the maybe we have a part 2 i don't know whether i'm going to have a part 2 uh, uh, in this part two, session part 
<laughs> but I want to show you this uh, very interesting uh, tumor uh, of which I am so fond of. I love to do this tumor because uh, we, we in the Royal Pearl keep, you know, wanting to do this tumor. One of the challenging tumors in the uh, field of uh, neurosurgery as well as in skull-based surgery is craniopharyngioma. Of course, uh, uh, the, this is the person who named uh, 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 craniopharyngioma as uh, craniopharyngioma, Professor Harvey Cushing. And he always said that it's the most formidable tumor uh, in uh, brain surgery. And even today, it remains to be a formidable tumor. It was called uh, Erdheim's tumor before. It was a German pathologist who named this as Erdheim's tumor, but it then changed its name as uh, craniopharyngioma. Now, I'm going to now show you a very, very brilliant case. Of course, uh, uh, I will show you this case, a very interesting case. Uh, this is around nine minutes. I'm going to show you this case completely. Now, a 17-year-old female present to us with headache and diminishing vision. Okay, now the CT and the MRI. So whenever you have a patient having a diminishing vision, take a CT scan. Why do you want to take a CT scan? You can see here, of course, a little blurred, but you can see that there is calcification. A, a calcification seen in the supracellar quadrant should arise the suspicion of a craniopharyngioma. It's very, 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 very important. It's very important. So you have calcification here, in the supracellar, the cell, supracellar quadrant, and you have a, a MRI showing a beautiful tumor sitting right between the carotids. That's the third ventricle going right, that's the lateral ventricle. And you can see that's the pituitary. You can see the pituitary on the sagittal, and I am now starting the surgery. This is how we do the surgery. And I partially resect the middle turbinate, and uh, on the right side, this is always done for massive supracellar tumors. Of course, for a cellar, very small microadenoma, maybe I might not do this. And that's the cavity and a half. That's a posterior ethmoid being opened up. That's a superior turbinate being lateralized. And once I do that, now you see how beautiful you're able to see. And I use my deep rider. Of course, now in the COVID era, uh, I did one JNA a couple of days back. I didn't use the deep rider at all. This is a posterior ethmoid artery. And once you do that, that's the right nasal cavity. I'm going to rise a uh, that flap. Now, please understand, if you have a supracellar tumor, 100% you're going to have a CSF leak. And for that, you have to rise a Haddad flap. Now, on the other side, I'm using the cobulation to cobulate off the posterior septal branch of the sphenopalatine artery. I can do a reverse flap from there. It's called the reverse flap. And that's a Haddad flap on this side and the reverse flap on that side. That's the owl's eye appearance. You do a shirt. Triple osteotomy, this is a triple osteotomy, that's a plane, it's called the planar osteotomy. This is called the planar osteotomy and two shoulder osteotomies. So I'm doing the planar osteotomy first and then I will do two shoulder osteotomies and this is the exposure I get. See, beautiful exposure of the cella. You can see that's the tuberculum, that's the planum. And what will I do? I will start drilling all that, that's a cella, that's a carotid artery. And I'm now going to forward a little bit because that's a transplanar approach. You see here, I'm drilling the planar. You see how I'm drilling the planar. It's like a, it's called the wedge osteotomy. It's called the wedge. See how I'm using my free elevator. Always do it from forwards to behind. Never use a punch forceps. I've seen many, 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 many people using a, a, a ronger or the sphenoid punch here. I do not agree with that uh, technique because you might puncture the dura. That's very important. In this technique, you, it's very unlikely that you will puncture the dura. Then I do a cellotomy. I will drill off the cellar floor. And once I do that, I will show you the exposure of this case. I'm doing the cellar uh, floor. And then I do the uh, tuberculum. This is the exposure. See the carotid now. See how beautifully I can uh, visualize. I'm sorry. I can visualize the carotid. Just a minute. Here we are, now that's the osteotomy. And that's how we are now mapping the carotid artery. See, that's a paraclival carotid, that's a paracellar, and that's actually the uh, uh, paracellar carotid, and then that's an MOCR. You see, the whole carotid has been laid naked. And then what you do is go just above the superior intercavernous sinus and make a flap. It's called the U flap above. And once you do that, you see the arachnoid. And what do you see first? You see the superior hypophyseal artery. Somebody asked me, how do you dissect the superior hypophyseal artery? This is how we dissect. You see here, that's the superior hypophyseal artery. 
and you are asking me how do I dissect a stock? That's the stock. See here, that's the stock. This patient, the stock was involved. You see, the stock was involved. That's the superior. See how beautiful the picture is. You can never do this with a microscope. Please, from above, you cannot see this. You see how I'm dissecting the superior artery artery with an elevator. You see, both the superior artery arteries have been dissected. That's a calcified part of the tumor. And now what I'm going to do is always, always, my dear friends, you have to use a sharp dissection. Most important, many people pluck. Here is where I have seen humpty number of surgeons using a, a black sleeve or a cup forceps and just plucking it. And if you pluck it, you're going to injure the stock or you're going to injure a perforator. This is very, very important. So what you have to do is a complete, uh, now that is actually the biopsy. I've already dissected it. I'm just taking that calcified part, just that, that's it. After that, completely I'm doing it with the scissors. A pair of scissors is the best. Sometimes we use the CUSA, but I honestly believe that this kind of dissection, uh, just a suction tip, and a scissors dissection. So you ask me how I, I, I dissect the stock. That's a stock. You see now, always, always, please remember, it's the same like the pituitary. Don't go for the chiasm now. Chiasm is the last. So the superior part of the tumor, do it last. So you see how the views are, and always the instruments are below the endoscope. See, now I'm slowly removing the wall of the craniopharyngioma. You can see now, you can see how I'm dissecting the wall very, very clearly, every stroke under vision, so that I don't injure a single perforator. You can see the dissection technique. So the, see, see the perforator here. You can see that perforator. So every time you dissect, you want to prevent injury to the stock, you want to prevent injury to the superior peripheral artery, the most important thing is use sharp dissection, not a cotton and push. Never use all that technique. That's all bad techniques. The best technique is a dissection technique and that you should have a very good cull stores, uh, right and a left scissors. Don't push with a cotton ball and just don't, that is not the kind of dissection you do it. You do that in the orbit, not inside the brain, not inside the brain. This is, see the stock, this is the stock. You separate the stock from the tumor only by a sharp dissection, not by a blunt dissection. Some people use uh, uh, some elevator to elevate it. That also is not good because you see the stock, how thin the stock is. That's the superior facial artery. See how I've, I've uh, saved both the stock and the superior facial artery by a sharp dissection. My dear friends, this is the most important point. If today you're taking a point from this lecture, I think this will be the carry home message. Do sharp dissection, not blunt dissection. So this is the carry home message, that's the stock. You see how thin the stock is, but still I have not cut the stock. Try to preserve the stock as much as possible if it is a functioning uh, uh, pituitary. Uh, that's very important because if it is not a pan hypopituitarism, if it, there are cases where totally the function of the uh, pituitary is gone, this is the pituitary here, uh, it's gone. So then you can actually cut the stock, but here I wouldn't because the patient has a good function. And now you can see the basilar artery. That's the basilar artery. That is the, that's the third cranial nerve. Very clearly seen, third cranial nerve. That is the PCA, SCA, and that's the P1 perforator. You can see all the beautiful structures. That's the interparenchymal system. You can see that. This is the interparenchymal system. And you see a lot of uh, uh, tumor is attached in the uh, superior quadrant. You see that now gently trying, I can't do a sharp dissection here because my scissors will not go, it will cut the optic. So it's very important that you be very careful when you dissect here and you should get a cleavage point and then start doing the sharp dissection. Now you see, I got the cleavage and then I started doing the sharp dissection. And you see what, what is the view? See the foramen of Monroe. This is the uh, choroid plexus. You see how beautiful the views are with an endoscope. You should see that there is no petechia here. This is very important. And then you see here till the end, Till the end, it's only sharp dissection and not the blunt dissection. And this patient is still coming for follow-up. I think around uh, two and a half years now, this girl, young girl, she was studying, uh, I think, engineering. And now still she's able to, uh, she had complete uh, diminution of vision. Now she's able to see very well. No uh, evidence of uh, any stock problem on the long run. Usually in cranios, you have DIs. Most of my, most, more than 90% of patients 
have DI uh, post cranial surgery. This is very important because that is a rule because you will have to manipulate the stock. The tumor itself is sitting there. See, you've completely cleared the tumor and you see how I'm irrigating. Irrigation is another very important part of the uh, uh, surgery. You see, I irrigate, irrigate, irrigate till I don't have any blood. You do, should not have a clot, you should not have bleeding. And then I play surgery cell. You see how I'm, see the stock. I'm using Duragen here, Duragen. This is Duragen. I'm using the Duragen. And once I use the Duragen, I will put in a little um, uh, Haddad flap here. That's a Haddad flap, completely covering it. Of course, uh, you do a post-op scan. And that's, I think, the end of, I have so many videos, but I'm sorry, uh, I think due to the lack of time, exactly one hour now, uh, Dr. Puya is very, very strict on timing. I know that. And uh, I think I'm, uh, I, I think I'm uh, done with my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. My exit, full exit. Uh, okay, I think I'm out of my screen share. I think. Dr. You're good. You're good. You're good. We we just watching your face and. Uh, yeah. It's really so, what are the carry home points? The carry home points are point number one: read your MRI and the CT scan. First of all, if the patient comes with a presenting complaint of headache or, for example, uh, diminishing vision, bitemporal hemianopia, or unilateral complete blindness, you might you have to suspect a supracellar lesion. And when you suspect a supracellar lesion, immediately take a scan. And there are some formulas. Of course, I'm not able to tell all that because maybe I'll do a part two. I can show you various videos. Like, for example, in the meningioma, where will be the pituitary? In a cardoma, where will be the pituitary? In an astrocytoma, how will the pituitary look like? In a, a glioma, how will the, uh, where will be the stock? Where will be? So everything has got a formula. With that, you can clearly map the kind of tumor you are. We've done pilocytic astrocytomas. We've done so many varieties of tumors. And of course, I cannot cover all the tumor, uh, all the uh, videos in just one hour. It's not possible. It's an ocean. It's a big ocean. And so number one is... Once you suspect, take a CD scan, look for calcification. The commonest tumor there is a craniopharyngeal. If you have calcification, think cranial. You, uh, or you can have some other tumors, cardomas can come. So number three is you look for the position of the normal gland, okay? And take an MRI. In an MRI, take a T1, a T2, a T1 with contrast, and a DWI. So four different kinds of images you take, map the tumor. So you have various classifications of tumors. Uh, if it is be, be behind the stock, it's called retroinfundibular. Before the stock, it's called preinfundibular. Inside the stock, it's called infundibular. Type A, type B, and type C. You have so many varieties. Of course, again, we'll have another class on that. So now, once you have mapped the tumor, map the surgery in your mind. That is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a carotid exposure. I'm going to uh, save the superior facial artery. I'm going to do an intraarachnoid dissection. All this you have to clearly understand. And as far as possible, be very gentle. And as I told you, the most important point, be careful about the perforators because the perforators are very, very vital in the supracellular system and they can actually cause disaster. They can actually produce either uh, infarcts or they can produce, uh, we have seen uh, people doing um, uh, uh, thalamo perforator injuries. And that is actually a disaster. You will have a hemiplegia. Patient will go back with a, a hemiplegia. This is not a, the right thing to do. You'll have an infarct in the, um, um, the internal capsule. So all these are problems. So what you have to do is you have to do a sharp dissection. You have to visualize, do a complete forehand technique. And I'm sure that you will get good results. And of course, once we have more classes on super, supracellular area is an ocean, it's a big ocean. And third ventricle tumors itself is a big ocean. Can we do it endoscopic, not endoscopic? So many things are there. Of course, with this just a prelude uh, introduction to that, I complete my lecture. I'm talking from my OT, OR, that's why the, the, the light is green. I'm sorry about my greenish uh, uh, lighting. Uh, because uh, I'm actually talking from my OR. So if I have any questions, you have time, uh, I'm ready to answer. Uh, Dr. Puya, thank you so much uh, for your wonderful uh, conduct of this uh, nasal sano. I'm really impressed with you and uh, God bless you. I'm ready for the questions.
Um, um, I think that we, if you agree with me, I will collect all the questions. We are not going through the question right now because uh, if in order to have the people really uh, um, uh, performance and a complete view of what we want to reach, which is an education and a teaching program, uh, the questions should be asked at the end. So in that time, due to the fact that we are planning the second step and second part and third part, we will reach to the end. And after that, they will have their um, answer for, the, for their question. So in order to do it, we will plan it for the next few days or weeks, some instructional courses. One thing that I would like to stress is to attend every one of those. Otherwise, you will lose the, the line you will you you will miss some things that, that are essential. We will probably go through the differential diagnosis through the imaging, which is uh, is very brilliant from you, uh, as you as you already said that uh, is essential a preoperative imaging guidance uh, that will reach to our uh, um, surgical plan, and then we will go through some anatomical variation and some uh, uh, redefining. Uh, anatomical perspective because the endoscopic point of view is completely different from an open approaches so only able and capable surgeons can reach to define what's the, the differential and i think that you and your capability to inspect from the different point of view are essential and you will have uh, uh, a complete uh, three-dimensional uh, Im images guidance uh, in your mind. You will tell us what to do and not to do. So for all the attendees, uh, please uh, remember to check out our pages, both the association, my page, and also the pages from uh, the team of Dr. Jana Kiram. Whenever you want to go in, uh, in uh, his page, uh, Facebook page, you will see amazing cases. I was completely shocked from the third ventricle and mammillary bodies images because it was like, wow, this is completely amazing. So in order to do it, you will be able to see uh, the next appointment. Uh, don't forget tomorrow's one. Joao Flavio Nogueira is going to talk about the second part of the endoscopic anatomy of the middle ear. Then on Friday, we will, go, we will have the American Rhinologic Society Juniors. And after that, both uh, uh, also in, in the Friday, Professor Castelnuovo is talking about uh, the fundamentals for the COVID-19 skull-based surgery. And probably in this uh, um, weekend or on Monday, we will have uh, Dr. Johnny Karam talking about other things. We will plan it today. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Johnny Karam Nairan, and, uh, for your participation. And, uh, and we will give some details in the next few hours. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you all, and uh, be safe, be home, and uh, take care because this is the COVID era, and uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Well, God bless you.